Okay, we're on the sixth constant mitzvot, and we're on page 73, day 10. We were, t- were talking about how to uh, boost your emuna, how we can internalize it. So we have a story. It says on September, uh, on Sunday, October 9th, 1994, Nachshon Wachsman, an Israeli soldier, returning to his home in Jerusalem from a training course in the north, was kidnapped by Hamas terrorists. Two days later, Hamas gave Israel an ultimatum. If they would choose, if they would not release Hamas leaders and terrorists serving jail sentences, Nachshon would be executed at 8 p.m. on Friday night. The state of Israel was mobilized in one of the greatest displays of unity since the time the state was founded. To quote Esther Wachsman, Nachshon's mother, I asked women throughout the world to light an extra Sabbath candle for my son. From about 30,000 letters that poured into our home, into our home, I learned of thousands of women who had never lit Shabbat candles, who did so for the sake of our son, who had become a symbol of everyone's son, brother, or friend. On Thursday night, 24 hours before the ultimatum, a prayer vigil was held at the Western Wall, and at the same hour, prayer vigils were held throughout the world in synagogues, schools, community centers, public squares, throughout the world. People of good faith everywhere hoped and pleaded and prayed for Nachshon. At the Western Wall, 100,000 people gathered with almost no notice, Hasidim and black coats, and long side curls swayed back, Swayed, uh, swayed and prayed and cried side by side with young men in torn jeans, ponytails and earrings. There was a total unity and a solidarity of purpose. Religious and secular, left wing and right wing, Sephardi and Ashkenazi, old and young, rich and poor, an occurrence unprecedented in our un- sadly fragmented society. Unfortunately, the salvation that everyone expected did not come. Israeli intelligence learned where Nachshon was being held. An elite rescue team raided the house, but Nachshon was killed along with Nir Poraz, the captain of the rescue unit. Many people were left with questions, but Mr. and Mrs. Wachsman, Wachsman were not. Mr. Wachsman asked Nachshon's Rosh Yeshiva, Rev. Mordechai, alone to include in his eulogy that a father would like to say yes to his children all the time, but there are times when he must say no. World Jewry had begged Hashem to return Nachshon for, some, for reasons unknown to us. Hashem, our merciful Father in heaven, said no. Now that's, a, that's only, by the way, we should understand, only the bereaved can say this. Somebody coming to the bereaved, if you ever uh, go to a shiva house, you never ever give a reason for somebody's death. You don't try to do that. It's none of our business. That's not for us. We're not God. But a, the ones who are mourning, they are the only ones who can come out with a statement like this. So we have to understand that. It was also a very deep connection that, they ha- that they're demonstrating to God that they have. That they that they trust God implicitly, that this was what's good, what was best, and even though it's a no, again we, we asked, we said no, it still was for Nachshon's best, if you will. That is a type of emuna that we're trying to get across. That somebody has to really trust that Hashem uh, knows what He's doing. We're on seventy-four. Will viewing the world with emuna explain every detail of our lives? No but it is likely to help us notice the pattern. We will begin to see ourselves being drawn closer to perfection, just as the world took a step closer to perfection during Nachshon Vachman's captivity, and what and was the perfection that we all got along. Think about that, I mean, that's an amazing thing. We didn't, uh, none of, no, very few people, in other words, worldwide, knew Nachshon Vachman. They got a call, they got a plea on the internet, and they decided to follow along because a, a brother, a child, was stolen in his youth. I mean, you can guarantee that Nachshon 
was not uh, 70 years old. He was a young kid. So, and still, and that, that awoke everybody that no matter what you were, religious, not religious, Ashkenaz, and like he's saying, they all got together. And that was drawing close to perfection. And even if we cannot make sense of the outcome, we can accept the fact that Hashem is bringing us closer and closer to Him. So he says, life can be frightening without Amuna. The world is moving at a dizzying pace, and technological advances bring us live reports of world events that we would not have been aware of had we lived a hundred years ago. Again, that's the power of the internet, that's the power of the TV, it's, uh, it's the power of the telephone. We used to have to th wait a long time to get news. Today, you just throw on uh, yahoo.com or MB MSC, MSNBC or whatever, your Fox, whatever you want to go to, and you can get all the news 24 hours a day, 24-7. Except for Shabbos, it makes it 24-6. <laughs> okay. So, Emunah allows us to understand some of these events, but more importantly, it gives us a sense of security that someone, capital S, is orchestrating each and every one of them. A man, so the story goes, a man once came to the Chafetz Chaim to bemoan his lot in life. He said, I earn my living as a peddler, traveling from village to village. Sometimes I'm away from home for a few days, sometimes a few weeks. I travel through the bitter cold of winter and under the blazing summer sun. Until recently, I was able to comfort myself in my travels because I knew that in a matter of days or weeks, I would be able to go home where my beloved wife would be waiting for me with some good food, a comfortable bed, and, a radiant, and the radiant warmth of a Jewish home. Recently, however, my wife died. Now, not only do I have to suffer from my conditions on the road, but I don't even have the comfort of knowing that I will eventually be able to uh, restore my strength. I have no home to return to. The Chafiz Chaim extracted an important message from this man's tale of woe. Our journey through this world is at times filled with pain and difficulty. Without emuna one can become discouraged during such times. Fortunate are those who realize this world is fleeting, that every measure of pain has a purpose and that they will soon be able to return, quote unquote, home and enjoy the warmth of the divine presence in the world to come. Now that's the Chafiz Chaim, we can pull that out of that story. Uh, but again, I think we call appreciate what the Chafiz Chaim was getting at. We, as long as we have Amuna, as long as we have trust in Hashem, and knowing that he's everything is going to everything is for our best then we can be comforted in what, regardless of what happens to us if we don't have that if we lack that or if it's not as well developed then we will have those that angst when things go wrong so he says we now understand with practical emuna he goes into practical emuna we now understand why it's important to internalize emuna and we know that the mitzvah of Amuna includes the belief that the world was created for a purpose. Now comes the hard part. Reflecting that belief through our, through our actions on a practical level. So let's look at three examples following the chronological order of the day of, of the life of a Jew to see how practical Amuna should affect our lives. So one, setting Hashem before you. In his first gloss to the Shulchan Aruch in Orachayim, commenting on the Shulchan Aruch's teaching of how a Jew should arise each morning, the Ramah. And again, Rav Moshe Islis is his name. He writes, Shiviti Hashem lenegdi tamid. I have set Hashem before me always. That's from Tehillim. As it, he says, that is an essential principle in following the Torah and in virtues of the righteous. If a person lives with the constant realization that Hashem is watching him, he will consider his conduct more carefully than if he feels he is not under observation. Do you guys believe that? Yeah? yeah? Okay. And what's it likened to? You can have two examples. One, one, your teacher walks in the room. <laughs> then you stop acting up. If you were acting up, you will stop acting up. If, you, if you're on the... Uh, even if you're following speed limit when you see a police officer, 
you will glance at your, very quickly, you will glance at your speedometer, you will make sure your seatbelt is on, you will make sure that you are flying right, if you will, okay? And so there are times that we all know what this is, that when we know that somebody is watching us, we suddenly become very super sensitive. Someone who can punish us. Somebody who can punish us, or somebody that we want them to think that we're good. Santa Claus, <laughs> okay? So in all those things, we in, in, think about the, the myth of Santa Claus. If you're good, you'll get something good in your stocking. If you're bad, you get cold in your stocking. So the kids would act good because Santa's apparently marking all this down in the North Pole. Okay, that was the mythology. Weeks. Sorry. At least for the weeks leading up. At least for the couple of weeks. Right, up. right, right. So are you good or are you bad? So that was the mythology of that, or is the mythology of that. Here, this is not mythology. What we're saying is, if we can understand that Hashem is right here, right now, and watching exactly how we speak, what we do, how we, how we dress, and no matter where we are, that Hashem is right there, so then we, are more, we will be more apt to be careful with what we do, how we act, regardless of who we're with, or not with, okay? And we'll always follow the straight and narrow. We're always going to do what we should be doing. That's what the Ramah was trying to impress on us at the very beginning of the Shulchan Aruch. Never mind everything else, never mind how to put the film on, never mind where you should be in, in services, never mind treating people correctly in business. All that puts aside to the, if, if I can remember one thing, Hashem is always in front of me. And there's never a moment that He's not. So that's what He's setting up there. While Ramah's teaching applies to every decision we make in life, let us focus on just one practical point. Are we supposed to stand out as much as possible, or should we try to avoid publicity? Are we supposed to make ourselves obvious? Are we supposed to make our observance obvious to others, or should we conceal our virtues? There are valid arguments for each side. On the one hand, we can teach others by making our observance noticeable. On the other hand, there's a concept of modesty, of shunning recognition. So how should we, how should we behave? The precept of setting Hashem before us always requires us to judge on a case-by-case -case basis. There are, not, there are times when we need to show publicly that we are willing to stand up for our rights to observe Torah and mitzvot, and even to risk our lives for that observance. And there are instances in which we can teach others by example. To maintain our privacy in such instances is not modesty, but selfishness. So that's an interesting way to look at that. For the most part, however, our mission in this world is to fade into the background. The righteous Jews who lived in the shtetls of Europe or the old city of Yerushalayim in the early 20th century would have been happiest if no one would have known that they were born and no one would have taken note when they died. They just wanted to study Torah and to serve Hashem, to become great without anyone ever discovering the greatness. Be, uh, being discovered might cause them to become vain, as human recognition will almost always do. They went, uh, they, they went out of their way to hide their deeds, to be as con inconspicuous as possible. They tell the story of, I think it's Rav Hamnuna, I think it's, one, I think it's him, uh, who, when they asked him, what's your name? He said, I'm just a Jew. He didn't want to say who he was, because he, if, if it's him, because it, by identifying who he was, they would have given him great honor. So you have other people in the Talmud that run away from honor, and so on and so forth. So this is, uh, it, it, if it's going to be something that's going to cause you to become vain, then you want to avoid it. If it's going to help others grow, so then you want to do it. So again, it's a balancing act. What should I do? What shouldn't I do? Doesn't mean I should wear sitsis out so that people see, oh, that's what sitsis are, and that's how sitsis should be worn. Compared to how people think sitsis should be worn, when well, people have payas. So, oh, that's what the corners of your head look like? Or the beard, whatever the case is going to be. Tefillin, when you wear tefillin, and the people see it's up here and not here. <laughs> that's apparently amazing for people to understand. But uh, and, and if you watch any of the movies, it's always here 
It's never here. Okay? Because they don't know any better. But that's, uh, and apparently no, no Jew is on staff to tell them. I'm not, nobody Jew who puts on the phone is there. Well, maybe the Jews are doing it on purpose so that they should say, this is not how we put the phone on. And then they're not transgressing any prohibition. So I, if I want to give them the side of merit. Okay? So it could be that they have some Jewish there. It says, no, put it here. Put it here. Because it's a mitzvah to put it here. Not whatsoever. Okay. For the mo- uh, so a man once asked Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky's Heusbacher, which is a Yiddish word that means a young man who assisted the Rav in his later years. So they asked him what he had observed during his years of serving such a great man. Nothing, the man replied, absolutely nothing. Rav Yaakov would determinedly consider all of his actions in, in advance to avoid letting anyone see any of his halachic stringencies that he kept. It's also, uh, and why would that be impo- uh, important? To hide the stringencies, not, not to make a big deal of it. Anybody? If people would see what he was doing, they would try to emulate him. He's a big rabbi. So they would try to say, oh, this is how you should be doing it. And he was saying to everybody, no, I'm doing it because I want to be stringent upon myself. But it's not something you need to take upon yourself. So that's why he would not want to put that out in front of everybody. So Amuna allows you to become great quietly. You feel comfortable with the fact that Hashem knows that you are great and you shun recognition unless that recognition will help, will, uh, will be helpful to others. Number two, talk to Hashem. Now here's, here's prayer and this is also a very interesting approach he's going to take here. After rising with uh, Hashem on your mind, we proceed to Davin. All forms of tefillah, of prayer, imply emunah because a person praying before Hashem obviously believes he, that he exists. But there's one form of tefillah that indicates a deeper level of faith. It's, the Torah states, When you come to war in, the land, in your land, on those who, the enemy who wants to oppress you, and you will blast on your trumpets, and you will be remembered before Hashem your God, and He will save you from your enemies. And you will be saved from your enemies. Fine. So this verse is astounding. Does Hashem forget us if we do not blow the trumpets? Must we sound trumpet blast to remind Him, God, that we are in trouble? So the Ramban writes, Nachmanis writes, that this verse teaches that there is a mitzvah to pray in times of need. Although the Torah is referring to a time of drastic need, such as war, Nachmanides defines time of need to refer to any feeling of need. No matter how trivial a need may seem, it provides an opportunity and a mitzvah to pray. When we think of Yisorim, affliction, we think in terms of painful illnesses or extreme poverty. But the Talmud and Arachin states that a person who reaches into his pocket to pull out three coins and pulls out two has suffered Yisorim, has suffered affliction, because he must reach into his pocket a second time to retrieve the third coin. How is that Yisorim? Can you imagine? You, 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 uh, you put your hand in your pocket and you knew you had three coins. You pull out two. Oh, I have to put it back in. That's Hashem punishing you. Wow. Wouldn't we all like such simple punishments? <laughs> the Talmud is teaching that Hashem wants our lives to be perfect. If we are inconvenienced even slightly, we should feel that there is a reason why it happened. If a person understands how perfect Hashem wants life to be, he can feel a, quote unquote, time of need every 10 minutes. And there will be a mitzvah to pray to Hashem every time. You're hot, you're hot, you're cold, you don't have enough food. Don't complain to your friends or feel miserable. Daven to Hashem. <laughs> Speak to the one who has the power to change things. Your tefillah, now this is, again, now it finally gets to a point where he has to say this. Your tefillah does not need to be formal. You do not have to hold a sidor or recite a word from Tehillim. Go into a room. Remember, this is practical advice. Go into a room, 
shut the door or stay where you are and whisper under your breath so that others won't hear and talk to Hashem. Tell them, Hashem, please let that check clear in time to cover my expenses. Hashem, please make my boss happy with, me, with my work. This form of prayer is a litmus test of Amunah for two reasons. First, it shows that you realize that there is someone to turn to, to an all-knowing and all-caring God who can solve all of your problems. Moreover, if you, if you can stand in an empty room and talk to Hashem without feeling as if you were talking to yourself, it is clear that you are certain that He is there. You know that Hashem exists. Your Amun has penetrated deep into your heart. So you understand what he's, he's suggesting here? You have a problem. You can go to your boss, you can go to anybody you want, your, your teacher, parent, spouse, doesn't matter. And you can talk to them, but really who's the only, per, only thing that has the power to help you? In reality, Hashem. Hashem. Hashem is the only one. Now Hashem can talk through, your, through all those people I just mentioned, or through, or through the Sidor, or through the Tehillim, or through the Torah. It can, there's so many ways for Hashem to talk, to give us the answer. All we have to do is listen. But the first thing is to start the conversation. And again, it doesn't mean that I have to start with, praise to you, Hashem, King of the Universe. <laughs> I talk to God. I've already davened. I've already said all what I had to say via the Sidor. Now I'm having a conversation. I'm going further than what I did in prayer. And that's something, that's something very important to realize, that I can talk and should be talking to God all day long. Because God is my father, my king, my friend, everything all wrapped together. That's why we say, Melech, Ozir, Moshim again. If you think about that. Melech, king, Ozir, a helper, Moshiach, a savior. Melech, Ozir, Moshiach, um again, and shield. He's everything. And so I just have to ask Hashem. It doesn't mean Hashem will say yes because you asked. <laughs> it just means that you're having a relationship and you're, you're, ex you're acknowledging to yourself that there's, there's a, a something greater than you and everything you know, namely Hashem. So the Chazin Ish instructed a, a, one of the students to work on Amuna through tefillah. Each time you need something, ask Hashem to help you obtain it, he said. If you need to buy shoes, for instance, ask Hashem to send you money and help you decide where to buy a good pair of shoes. After you buy the shoes, thank Hashem for them. You will find yourself turning to Hashem all day and your emunah in Him will become more profound. So that's a practical way to do this. Now, I don't know if you're all going to do this, running home, uh, I need to study, so Hashem, please give me the build to study, I, whatever it's going to be, okay? I'm not sure if everybody can instantaneously do this, but you're not supposed to do it instantaneously. It's supposed to be a work in progress. And it starts off just a little bit, and you keep continuing it. Okay, that's again how to ensure that you have this emuna instead of just saying, I have the faith, I believe, brother. Because I believe doesn't mean anything. If I truly believe that I'm going to talk to Hashem, because I know that Hashem is the only one who can get the job done. So when you combine your lottery ticket and you're singing, if I were a rich man, the, it's not enough to sing it, you should ask Hashem, Hashem, the bunch of them, I know that I may not be fit for this, but can you just, instead of giving me the billion, how about just 50,000? <laughs> just a little bit of a pay raise. Maybe, it wouldn't hurt. <laughs> you're not changing some eternal plan. You can say that. What? I said something like that. There you go. Very much like that the other day. And the point is, that's nothing wrong. You're having, a, you're having a conversation. You're saying, Tata, Dad, no, I need some money. I, I need to pay off my bills. I need this, I need that. You're the one who can get it done. So if you don't mind, could you please write a check out to me? And, you, you know, however you get that check, you get that check. It could be you get a bonus. It could be somebody gives you a birthday gift. And somebody told me, I've heard this story a couple of times, different people, but somebody said they needed a certain amount of money. And they, uh, they didn't know where they were going to get it from. And they davened, they davened, okay. And they didn't daven specifically for that money, but the, the, per, the, the spouse said, what are we going to do? And they said, don't worry, don't worry. Hashem always helps. They had such, such a moon in that. Hashem helps. 
And then what happened was somebody from a long time ago, they had somebody from a long time ago, suddenly sent, uh, sent them a check for the exact amount that they needed, to the penny, to the penny. And it was a strange amount. It wasn't like $200, it was $232.33. <laughs> Something like that. And the, the guy looks at the check, he says, unbelievable. Pays off the bill he had to pay off. Very good. Saved. Then he calls the guy up and he says, I want to thank you for this, but it's a crazy number. <laughs> why that number? The guy goes through another competition to explain why he did it, but it was just amazing. Again, Hashem has his ways. Sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he makes you have your sorrow. And again, that's, but the question is, did you ask Hashem or did you just assume Hashem is going to read your mind? And know what you need because Hashem is Hashem. And that's what, if you think about it, in the Torah, it, uh, the people say to Moshe, and when Moshe is saying, uh, Hashem wants to separate from your wives three days before the giving of the Torah. And, and so the people say, now nah, we'll do whatever you say, no problem. And so Moshe goes to Hashem and says, the people said thus and so and so. And all the rabbis ask, why is, Hashem, why is Moshe telling Hashem what the people said? Hashem knows what the people said. And the answer is because it's only Derech it's only polite. He sent you on a mission to give the report. Even if, the office, even if Hashem knows, doesn't mean you shouldn't say it. So again, Hashem knows what we need. Hashem knows exactly all our desires. But if we have to ask for it. And you know when Hashem, uh, when Hashem showed Adam fire? Notice how do we know to make fire? You ever think about that? There wasn't, uh, people don't have to know fire. People have to know all these things. What I want to know is how it was that some Frenchman decided that snails and garlic mm -hmm. would be a good thing. No, no, no. But it, when it comes to fire, Hashem wanted Adam to realize he needed it before he made it, then he made it. When it comes to making a woman, Hashem brought all the animals to Adam and Adam would see male, female, male, female, male, female. And he says, wait a second, where's my female? At that point, Hashem could make the woman because until then he didn't realize that he was missing something. But once I realize I'm missing, once I realize I need something, I'm going to pray for that. I'm going to ask for that. When I ask for that, again, the, uh, your chances increase greatly of getting it. If I never ask for it, then I have zero chance of getting it. You don't buy the ticket. Don't buy the ticket. You can't, you can't win. Right. That's how it works. Okay, so now we get to Betachon. We've been talking about Emunah, faith. Now we're talking about Betachon. And so we're going to learn there's a difference here. If you managed to wake up with God on your mind and you find yourself talking to Hashem on a regular basis, you are ready for the most difficult challenge of all, namely bitachon. Chazan Ish writes that Emuna and bitachon are similar but not synonymous. <clears throat> Whereas Emuna refers to a theoretical knowledge of Hashem's involvement in our lives, bitachon describes an ability to reflect that knowledge in our actions. A person can talk about Amuna all day and night, but if his actions indicate that he truly believes in himself, his boss, or his money, he's not much of a believer at all, after all. Once we have internalized Amuna, we are sure that everything we own was granted to us by Hashem, and that He has the power to support us without having us lift a finger. Nevertheless, we are not allowed to rely upon miracles. We are not allowed to sit and wait for our sustenance to be sent directly from heaven. There is a certain amount of hishtadlut, of effort, that we must make while bearing in mind that hishtadlut, this effort, is nothing more than a requirement we must satisfy that, and that our needs are truly being filled by Hashem. You understand what that means? I know I need money, so what do I do? The American dream, I go to work. <laughs> Either that or I apply for the government. But I go to work. And then what happens is I make money. Depending on how hard I work, 
will determine how much, supposedly, will uh, determine how much money I make. Depending on the investments I make, will again determine if I'm going to uh, make money. Do I invest conservatively? Do I, do I invest aggressively? Do I invest... Uh, Bonds would not be conservative. It would be so far right conservative. It's not funny. But, you know, it's how do I invest? Very conservatively, conservative, moderate, and aggressive. All those things vary, by the way. And if you look at, if you ever get into the stock market, then you'll note, you will notice one thing. Over the short term, aggressive can make you a lot of money and it can lose you a lot of money. But over the sh long term, they all equal out for the most part. They're off by a very little. All those different portfolios I just said, they all vary maybe 1%. It's an amazing thing. So for the long term, if I'm going long term, I can make a, ne a decent investment and, and go with it. And I don't have to watch the ups and downs. So this, that's the effort I'm making. How much effort do I put into it? How much am I supposed to make? What am I supposed to have? If I don't do anything, Hashem won't make the miracle for me. Because we're not at that level. That level of Hashem giving us mana from, from, uh, from the heavens is over. That was one time in our existence, and that's gone. But, so now we have to do, and even there, by the way, we had to do something for that. Depending on where your Ramuna was, would determine if you had to go out to get your man or if it fell by your tent, the Midrash says. But it's still, we don't have that today. So we need to go out and we need to work. And we need to uh, do all those things. And today, for a person to go to college, was it uh, IUSB, is I think $10,000 a year. Again, if somebody doesn't have, a, a student is not going to be able to get so much money up so quick. 10,000. 10,000 is a lot of money of usable cash. So you have to get grants. You have to get all these other things to go out and you have to perform well. And then with that dream, the dream they sold us, if I get a college degree, that will be my ticket to success. I'll never forget that uh, my father had his, his car fixed, the body fixed, and they went to the body shop and the guy who was running it happened to be a uh, from that, uh, he must probably, he probably was from the 50s in, in that time period. And he looked at me, we, we, he went, I think, to the show or something, and he said to me, You know, they tell you you need a college education. You should get a college education, but he says it's a lie. I never graduated high school and I owned the store. He said, You know what I did though? That was smart. That I, I hired the guys who went to college, <laughs> I hired the people who know how to do this stuff. I made my money, they're my workers. So what's the old expression? The C, the, the D student hires the A student to make some money. <laughs> so, okay. So it's, I'm not going to belittle college, but I went to college. I think college is a nice thing to do. And I think that at certain levels, it's important. But if you're not looking for it, you're not for it. But in general, we think that that's going to make the money. And what we're learning here is no, that doesn't make the money. It's my hishtadlut, my bitachon, everything else, my emuna. Those are the three ingredients that I need. And yes, it's good to go to college. And yes, it's good to get a job. And yes, it's great to do all these things. But I should never, ever believe that those are what's doing it. That's his point. Okay? So the Chazan Ish helped to found a new Talmud Torah in B'nai Brak and sent someone to America to collect funds for the school. The collector failed miserably. He barely raised enough to cover his earfare. The man was too embarrassed to report back to the Chazan Ish. He simply could not tell the Gadol Hador, the giant of the generation, who was waiting anxiously for the funds, that no money was forthcoming. One day a messenger came to summon him to the Chazan Ish, left with no choice. He dragged his feet to the Chazan Ish's house, trying desperately to think of a way <coughs> to excuse his failure. <clears throat> to his surprise, the Chazan Ish greeted him with a hearty thank you. He showed the collector a check for $50,000, which had been sent by a generous donor from Australia. Australia, the collector wanted aloud. I didn't go to Australia. 
That check has nothing to do with me. Why are you thanking me? Yes, it does, the Chalzun Ish insisted. We are required to make an effort to fund the yeshiva, but in truth, the money comes from Hashem. You fulfilled the requirement by traveling to America, and Hashem sent us this money as a result of your efforts. So he says also on the bottom, where the Tanya de Be'eliyahus states that one must work in order to receive Hashem's blessing, as can be derived from the verse, in order that Hashem your God bless you in all of your handiwork. You must provide some handiwork for Hashem's blessing to be applied to. And that's why in the story of Elisha, I believe it was Elisha, the woman came to him, and the Shunammite woman came to him and said, I have no, or one of the women, said, I have no, uh, no way to make a living. So he said, bring me uh, all the pictures you have in your house. And she gets all the pictures, lines them up, and he says, here's a cask of oil, pour it in and fill up the pictures. And don't stop, don't stop filling until you've filled all the pictures. He had one cruise of oil, as it were, and it filled up all these pictures. She made money and so on and so forth. Again, what's the point? As long as you give God a little bit to work with, Hashem can work with, and then the miracles can happen. If I don't do anything, then I can't expect any help from that, which is, again, why I have to go to work, which is why I have to open the book, which is why I have to start the process. Once I start the process, Hashem can and will help me. Well, if I don't start and just sit back and say, okay, Hashem, nope. <laughs> it's up to you, man. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> Nothing's going to happen. Okay. Again, we're not at that level. So what, how much Hishtadlut do we have to do? What's the effort? He says on page 81, since Hishtadlut is a mere requirement, but not the determining factor, one of the most difficult challenges a Jew faces is how much effort to place into sustaining his family and how much to rely on Hashem. May a person buy a lottery ticket as his tadlis and go to the base madrash to study all and study Torah all day? Should a worker or businessman put in extra hours so that he will have money on hand for a quote-unquote rainy day? Or should he spend those hours learning and rely on Hashem to make sure that he does not need extra money? There are no definitive answers. Sorry, you thought I was going to come up with one? Can't. As these questions, each person must determine the amount of his toddlers he needs because based on an accurate assessment on his level of his level of amuna. The Talmud states that Rav Hanina's daughter mistook a container of vinegar for a container of oil and poured it into the, sa- the lamp for the Sabbath lights. She told her, he told her, that vinegar could burn. For the one who commanded oil to burn can command vinegar to burn as well. Indeed, the vinegar burned. But why was Rav Hanina allowed to rely on a miracle? Why wasn't he required to engage a more natural hishtatlis and more a natural effort? And once he was relying upon miracles, why didn't he just say, let there be light? What do you bother me to pour the vinegar in? <laughs> vinegar was something else. So Rav Hanina knew that as long as a person is here on earth, no matter how much immunity he has, he must still follow the basic rules of nature. On earth, and that goes, by the way, to what we learned yesterday of the laws of nature and the laws of the spiritual world. There are laws here. On earth, only flammable sub, uh, substances will burn. A command is not enough. But while we assume that oil is naturally combustible and vinegar is not, Rav Hanina realized that what we consider a quote-unquote nature is actually a series of miracles that Hashem chooses to perform on a consistent basis. And again, this, if you remember from last night, when we talked about the magicians, the Egyptian magicians, and they couldn't make the uh, lice come off from the ground. So the Ramban says they did everything right and they should have been able to do it and when they couldn't do it, when it didn't work, what they say, this is the finger of God. In other words, God is stopping us. We did everything we should be doing. This should be working. It's not working. God stopped it. That's what they say. That's what the, uh, uh, Nachman is telling us. So even though we think nature, we've decided because 
nature normally works in a very simplistic manner, if you will. It, it normally is very consistent. So what happens is when it's not consistent, we say, oh, a miracle, or we messed up, <laughs> something else happened here. And Rabbi Hanin is saying, no, you don't understand. Hashem, every time it works, it's a miracle. And so that's what he says, oil burns because Hashem miraculously causes it to burn. We consider it to be natural only because it happens consistently. Although he performs the miracle regularly, it's a miracle nonetheless. Rav Hanina knew, therefore, that Hashem could just as easily cause vinegar to burn. So, but that's a real level of bitachon and emuna. I mean, a real level of emuna. I'm trusting that this is how it works. Are, we, are you allowed to mimic Rav Hanina? It depends. If you are as certain as he was, that oil is no more inherently combustible than vinegar, perhaps. Perhaps. It won't work, however, if you have an iota of doubt in your heart as you strike the match and try to light the vinegar. You must know, as a matter of fact, that Hashem can, is able to cause it to burn. Attempting to light vinegar is a black and white case. Most of us realize that we are not on Reb Hanina's level and that we need to engage in a more natural form of his tradut of effort in order to have light in our homes. The question for ordinary folk is not whether to engage in natural effort, his tradut effort, but where to draw the line. How do you determine how much his tradut of this effort to make and when to rely on emuna? You understand what the difference is, right? The theoretical versus the practical. By taking an honest look at your emotions, you, if you have no doubt, of, uh, if you have no doubt that your hishtadlut is enough, then you can rely upon emuna for the rest. But if you are worried, then more hishtadlut is necessary. So you have to make that decision on what's what's actually happening. So Rev Shmuel Salant was the chief rabbi of Yerushalayim in the 19th century. The people who settled in Eretz Israel at the time accepted a life of poverty but did so happily in order to study Torah and serve Hashem in the Holy Land. One of the primary benefactors of the yeshiva, Yeshiva Eitz Chaim, we will call him Mr. Gibber, was visiting Eretz Israel. Mr. Gibber was not particularly devoted to the Torah himself, but he had a warm place in his heart for the Torah institutions. And the administrator of the yeshiva felt that a meeting with the chief Rav of Yerushalayim might cause him to be even more generous in the future. The meeting was arranged, and as Mr. Gibber was conversing with Rav Yishmol Salant, a scrawny Yerushalmi dressed in tattered clothing and a dusty hat entered the room. Rav Shmuel Salant turned to him and asked warmly, what would you like? While waiting at the dentist this morning, the man replied, I thought of a novel approach to answer one of Rav Akiva Ega's questions. Excuse me, Rav Salant said to Mr. Gibber, I have to talk to this man. They went off into a corner and spent 25 minutes discussing the matter. After the man left, Rav Salant returned to Rav Giver, uh, Mr. Giver, who had been waiting impatiently at the table. I wonder, said Mr. Giver, his annoyance apparent in his voice, if we would see such a royal welcome extended to a mere beggar back where I come from. Are you aware, replied Rav Salant, that the person whom you have just described as a beggar is an outstanding and extremely humble Torah scholar. I could not continue our meeting while keeping such a great man waiting. The administrator, sensing that Mr. Gibber was still bothered by the long wait and not satisfied with Rev. Salant's explanation, tactfully brought the meeting to an end. They walked away from Rev. Salant's house in an awkward silence. The administrator began to worry that the years that he had spent developing a relationship with Mr. Gibber would go for naught, and that he had lost one of his most generous donors as a result of the meeting. Thankfully, the story had a happy ending. That evening, the administrator asked Mr. Gibber to accompany him to the house of the Yushalmi, who had interrupted his meeting with Rav Salant. They stood outside the house, peering through the window, and watched as the man studied Torah with his children with much joy and enthusiasm despite the poverty that was evident in their home. Mr. Gibb was so impressed 
with the site that he pledged to keep supporting the yeshiva, and he even insisted on apologizing to the scholar for the insult. So happy endings once again, fine. But what's going on is what he's going to do is explore the issue of how Rav Salant could act this way. She says, happy ending aside, why did Rav Yishmol Salant endanger the financial stability of the yeshiva by offending his visitor? True, Mr. Gibber didn't speak well, didn't speak about, uh, about Yushalmi Talmud Chacham with the proper respect, but did that justify risking the stability of the yeshiva? You hear the question? Okay, you have a lot of people who are relying upon this guy's money. So treat him nicely. You have to do your toddlers. You have to suck it up sometimes. Deal with it. Okay? So apparently, to someone of Rev. Yishmol Salant's stature, human benefactors do not support Torah institutions. Hashem supports them. The benefactor, again, this is total uh, emuna. This is not even, uh, this is beyond what we do. We look to the people who have the money, uh, the, uh, the 1%, and say, you guys got to support us. We need you, we need you, blah, blah, blah. You have too much money, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we, we are angry at them. We're complaining against them. Oh, not me, but people complain. I mean, not, that was the whole issue of the, what are they called on Wall Street? The uh, people who complain against... Uh, was it? Occupy movement. That's what their, their whole complaint was. How dear those people that it should be spread the wealth. Okay. Fools, if you will. If they ever hear this, they'll, they'll love me. It's 46 minutes. They should watch it this long. Okay. But, it's, uh, but it, it was foolish. So he says, Hashem supports them. The benefactors are merely messengers of Hashem. If they are not respectful to the cause that they are upholding, Hashem has other messengers who can step in. That's what he's holding. If so, why did the administrator appease Mr. Gibber? Anyone willing to live in Yerushalayim in those days had to have a strong measure of bitachon, of this, you know, of this certainty in Hashem. Shouldn't this, his bitachon have stopped him from the pandering to a man who didn't honor the Torah? In truth, from Shmuel Salant and the administrator of Eitz Chaim were both correct. The amount of hishtalut of effort a person must make is highly individualized. On Rav Shmuel Salant's level, pandering to a benefactor who did not respect Torah scholars was unnecessary effort. The, but the administrator was worried. <coughs> How would he replace the funds that Mr. Gibber was donating to the yeshiva? On his lower level of vitachon, he was required to make an effort to appease Mr. Gibber so that he would continue to support the yeshiva. Bitachon is complex. Is complex. It is the ultimate test of one's level of amun. A person can easily fool himself into thinking that he is doing something because he has bitachon, when in truth he is acting irresponsibly because he does not have that level of trust. Don't start by working on bitachon. First, work on placing Hashem before you constantly. Internalize the Muna by evaluating your actions based on whether they will bring you and the world closer to the purpose, to its purpose. Then work on tefillah. Talk to Hashem. Feel His presence at your side at all times. Finally, you'll be ready to express your absolute clarity in Hashem's existence by demonstrating bitachon in your actions. It might require painful sacrifice, and it might require you to act in a manner that others will consider irrational. Ultimately, however, such sacrifice will enable you to keep advancing in your level of emunah. We have completed the study of the mitzvah of Amuna, but we are not finished. Each year, we finish the Torah on Simcha Torah and immediately start again from Bereshit. We study the Parsha week after week, year after year, and we don't get bored. Why? Because as we go through life, we grow and develop. The insights we had into the Parsha last year were at our level of understanding last year. Now we are deeper, more analytical, broader, and more spiritual people. If we apply ourselves, we can understand the messages, messages better than we did last year. The messages that we took from the weekly Torah portion last year will be augmented by additional messages. The same is true for Emuna and the five mitzvot that follow it. As you grow, you should review the mitzvah of Emuna and find more and more meaning in it. And Emuna is a life's work. Rabbi Cheskel Levenstein would tell people that he was afraid to stop thinking about Emuna for a second lest he lose it. And that was coming from a person whom the Chazun Ish described as one who feels Amuna in a physical sense. 
We must keep working, keep gaining more clarity, or we can lose all that we have achieved. But this is not the only reason that we are not finished. As we study the other mitzvot, we will find that all are agros of emunah, and that we can fulfill them properly only when our lives are saturated with emunah. We'll have to stop there.